Okay, hello. I'm so glad that all of you could join us this evening for how and why to put local foods at the center of your Thanksgiving. I'm so excited to share with you this informative and fun evening, including a special guest appearance. I'm Ann Reddy, as Rick said, I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. This is a nonprofit run by community volunteers to celebrate Earth Day and to share and promote its ideals with our community. Earlier this year, we had planned a huge in-person multi-day Earth Day Festival for April 2020 that was gonna be held at the Emerson Center for the Arts and Culture to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And this event was gonna involve over 50 local businesses, including our major sponsors, Wrestler Motors and Oboe's Footwear, our local schools, the city of Bozeman, and nonprofits like our generous sponsor, Sacagawea Audubon <clears throat> Society. In addition to the Emerson space, the city had given us permission to block off um, one and a half blocks outside the Emerson because we had so many um, organizations that wanted to participate. And in the end, we had to put some on the waiting list because we just didn't have room for them all. So in addition, uh, the high school students from Bozeman High chose our theme for the Earth Day Festival, which was climate action for the last best place. All of our proceeds were to benefit the Bozeman High Solar Schools Club uh, to put solar panels on our high schools. Then due to the pandemic, our in-person event had to be canceled, but in its place, we held two online events. Um, one was Music for the Earth, and the second one was Films for the Earth that um, we partnered with the Bozeman Film Celebration to put on. Uh, we were so thrilled because we had over a thousand people attend these events online. And if you weren't one of them, it's not too late. I wanted to let you know that we have those recordings um, available on the Gallatin Valley um, website. So as we looked forward to next year's Earth Day celebration, we realized that we still had a lot that we wanted to share this year uh, for Earth Day. So we are really excited to announce a series of events under the theme Gallatin Valley 2040. So uh, why Gallatin Valley 2040? Well, I'm hoping that many of you were able to join us to watch the amazing film called 2040 that the city of Bozeman sponsored in partnership with the Gallatin Valley Earth Day um, last month. Uh, this really upbeat film inspired us to explore how we in Gallatin Valley could imagine and plan and work towards a brighter, healthier, um, vibrant future by 2040. And tonight is a kickoff, kickoff of that series. Uh, we have volunteers from um, all parts of our community that have joined together to create this really special evening. And I know that you're excited um, to start it and for tonight. So I promise to hand it over to Kate, our moderator shortly. But before I do, I wanted to give you a little taste of what our January um, event will be. And I'm happy to introduce our special guest tonight, Bob Quinn. Now, Bob is a Montana organic farmer. He is the author of the fascinating, and some people called it a mind-blowing book called Grain by Grain. He's also the founder of Kamut International. And he has graciously agreed to participate um, and be part of our January Gallatin Valley 2040 event. So now a few words from Bob. Hey, my name is Bob Quinn. I'm an organic farmer. I've been organic all, well, not all my life, but for the last 30 years. Uh, on our farm here in north central Montana near Big Sandy. Uh, this is a farm my grandfather started in 1920, so it's 100 years old. I'm glad to hear you guys are talking about what to eating locally for Thanksgiving. That's what we try to do. Um, you can see my garden right in the background there. A lot of the stuff that we're going to have on our table come out of that garden, including this um, carnival squash. This is the sweetest sweet potatoes, so we don't have sweet potatoes. That's what we have instead of sweet potatoes on our Thanksgiving table. And I'm also looking forward to talking with you some more in January about climate change and how it relates to good soils and good food. And we start, with, of course, with good seed. And all that is connected to good health. 
and look forward to talking to you more about that then. So, happy holidays. See you next year. Thank you, Bob. And actually, I'm really looking, I would, that squash really looks delicious and I'll have to get a hold of one of those. <laughs> now, without further delay, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator and the lead organizer for this event, Kate Burnaby Wright. Uh, Kate is an ecologist and writer by training. She works as a consultant and facilitator from her home in Gallatin Valley. Uh, her career in conservation and experiential education has led her from the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Rockies to some really exciting places like Africa, Mongolia, and uh, Alaska. Kate serves uh, in a number of organizations. One is as an advisor to the Montana Wilderness School. Uh, she's also a member of the Double Snap Dollars Network Equity Subcommittee. And she's also chair of the Open and Local Coalition, which is a growing network of professionals and community members who are dedicated to strengthening our community food systems in the greater Gallatin region. So Kate, take it away. Thank you very much, Anne. And welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Before we go any further, I wanna invite and I wanna thank our panelist, Dr. Shane Doyle, a member of the Upsalika Nation, Crow Nation, uh, to offer an indigenous people and land acknowledgement for the evening. Um, I look forward to introducing him a little more fully later in the program. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, and that's one of the very few times, Kate, that anyone's actually pronounced that correctly. So I have to say, um, good job. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's a great honor to be able to offer up a little prayer here. And I just want to ask the creator to bless all of us tonight. We come together in a good way on this homeland of so many different indigenous people, the Pagan, Upsalaga, Shoshone, Salish, Kootenai. There's just so many that have come here and called this place their home. And they've kept the waters clean and they kept the air clean and the land healthy. And we want to honor that in a good way. And we ask that you bless us all with good health uh, for our Thanksgiving holiday, for health for our children and our loved ones, and that we will continue to have good food to eat from this land. I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, now, before I introduce the first of our panelists, Lindsay, I just wanna orient folks with three quick thoughts. Um, the first is this term local. Um, what is local food? That's what we're here to speak about tonight. And I will say that it's understood many different ways. Um, there's hyperlocal, which means food from very nearby. It's defined by distance, maybe 15 miles. People define it differently. And eating this way is laudable. It's impressive, um, but it's often impractical, impractical or unattainable. So more loosely, local food often refers to healthfully produced food, which can be subject to an entire range of values or descriptors. There's, as some of you are probably familiar, free range, hormone-free, cage-free, grass-fed, grass-finished, organic, et cetera. Um, and all of these terms are valuable and they are meaningful, but in casual parlance or as a starting point for how we will use the word tonight, I want you all to think of local as a catch-all for crops that are raised, animals grown, and foods wild harvested thoughtfully at smaller scales, more equitably, and with less of a carbon footprint. So the second of the three things, why local, why? There are many, many different reasons why people care deeply about local food. Our speakers are gonna go into depth and I don't have time for that. So I just wanna set the stage by blasting through a quick top 10. Number one, local foods strengthen the local economy. They keep dollars in the community and provide more opportunities for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Number two, a vibrant local food sector provides the foundation for resilient community food systems. 
This improves access to fresh, local, healthful food, not just for those who can afford it, but also for all community members with a sort of spillover effect. Number three, a culture of fresh local food and increased access, this enhances the health of all people as it becomes a norm to include fresh produce and minimally processed foods in our day-to-day -day routines. Number four, the value of working cross-sector, knowing your farmer, your distributor, your grocer, your chef, your food service director, your cold storage facility, these relationships add depth and connection that strengthen community. Number five, strong local and regional food systems from production to storage to processing to distribution, they increase food security in the face of disruption, be it from pandemic or other interruptions to our supply chain. Number six, our food choices impact climate change, they're related. And as many of you may have read even more deeply than I have, um, there are estimates that range from a quarter to a third of global greenhouse gas emissions um, that can be attributed to agricultural practices and to food waste. Number seven, while our production methods continue to improve ecological impact of large scale food production on soil, water, pollinators and entire ecosystems is pretty undeniable. And people are working really hard to make it better but we're not there yet, everywhere. Number eight, um, that's undeniable, but that's not to mention the impact also on essential workers who cultivate and harvest the food we eat, yet they don't always receive equitable ethical treatment and fair wages. Number nine, here in the Gallatin Valley, where we are witnessing growth overtake our open lands, it's pretty intuitive that open land feeds us body and soul. Um, there's been a sense that if agricultural lands can remain economically productive and celebrated, there can be more momentum to conserve these lands for future generations. And number 10, the last reason I'll mention, I'm sure more will come up tonight. Um, this one is close to my heart as a mother and as an educator. In his influential book, Last Child in the Woods, Richard Louv explains that our kids are at risk of nature deficit disorder, which is a profound disconnection from nature that impacts health, resilience, creativity, and more. It's a concept that most people intuitively understand, especially here in Montana. Um, and no matter where we live, modern technology infuses our worlds, fundamentally shifting how we interact with nature. So as you read his book, you'll discover later on that the first trend characterizing this disconnect from nature is a severance of the public and private mind from food's origins. So local food systems help bring us back into relationship with our food. So, that's a pretty quick whirlwind of why. Um, now my third note before I introduce Lindsay, it's important to acknowledge that Thanksgiving, it is a beloved tradition, celebrating family, friends, harvest, sharing bounty and giving thanks. Yet Thanksgiving is also deeply complex with a founding myth that can obscure the devastating impact of colonists on native peoples. In short, Thanksgiving is understood and celebrated very differently depending on who you are. We're not here tonight to dive into the history of Thanksgiving, although it is worth exploring from the true story of 1621 to Washington and Lincoln, from the onset of the Macy's Day Parade to the National Day of Mourning. But I will say this, giving thanks, sharing bounty and honoring the harvest these are all timeless traditions practiced by peoples throughout time and around the globe. So it is in this broad tradition of giving thanks tonight that I wanna thank our three speakers for joining us to talk more deeply about how and why to put local food at the center of our Thanksgivings. Um, so now I get to introduce Lindsay. Um, Lindsay grew up riding a tractor, helping grandpa feed steers in West Central Wisconsin. 
She studied nutrition in college and worked for an on-campus CSA where she fell in love with growing food for students and her rural Minnesota community. In 2012, Lindsay moved to Montana and traveled the state to complete her training as a registered dietitian and Montana's beauty captivated her. She earned her master's of science in the sustainable food and bioenergy systems program at MSU. She's passionate about teaching dietetic students to leverage food and nutrition expertise to build place-based food systems in support of food sovereignty to improve health for all people and the land. Lindsay has also served as a food service director up in Polson and as assistant director of MSU Extension Nutrition Education. So with no further ado, Lindsay. Thanks, Kate, for that introduction and um, for everyone who made this event possible. It feels really good to be here with you all. And so I'm here tonight as um, Grant Programs Manager of Aero. Um, Aero is a nonprofit statewide that's been around for 45 years and really um, came about to support renewable energy and sustainable ag um, on farms. And what we're coming to realize is that even though food systems really need to draw down carbon and reduce emissions, we also need to focus on food systems that pr promote health for all people and peop all people throughout the food chain. So ensure equitable food systems. And so for that reason today, I wanna start thinking about what Thanksgiving means to us and some of the images that come up. We think about football, mashed potatoes, maybe squash, turkey, um, children's plays and gathering, sharing food with our friends and family and maybe giving back to the land. It's also a time about self-reflection. And I trust that a lot of folks here with us tonight have thought a lot about the environmental benefits of local food systems. And so I wanna challenge us to think about the myth of Thanksgiving and shed light on some of the root causes that created the food system that delivers food to our Thanksgiving tables today. So it may feel uncomfortable and maybe it should for just a little bit and that's okay. But our goal is not to feel guilt, but really to see a, a larger part of the story um, so that we can move towards healing and that together we're empowered to build new local food systems that really take this fuller history into account. And so unlearning the myth of Thanksgiving, I think we need to acknowledge that indigenous peoples and folks all over the world celebrate gratitude with each season, maybe each moon. And um, that that first Thanksgiving story may have happened as a political alliance, um, as a meal between some uh, an unnamed tribe and the pilgrims. Um, but what we don't hear in our traditional Thanksgiving stories is um, you know, that tribal nations did not just peaceably concede land and settler arrival brought really painful things, war, disease, broken treaties. And it's, it's really a story of taking and it doesn't tell a whole story of um, the tribal nations in 1620 or the 12,000 years in North America before then. So what we're unlearning at Arrow as we think about our food systems is um, to stop recreating structures and perpetuating stories that's, that center on the settler narrative. And instead, we really wanna focus on disrupting those stories so that we can create the new local food systems that um, bring us all together and create new realities. And so one way we can do that is to listen, learn, and build personal relationships and follow indigenous food sovereignty leadership. So the Blackfeet Agricultural Resource Management Plan is one example of a food sovereignty plan that's happening up in Blackfeet. And, um, the Fast Black Feet is also working on food sovereign or um, food security and sustainability up there. And so we can um, learn from these models that are translational from indigenous communities out into all communities and learn that by recognizing the myth, we can start um, to build something new, something different than modern agriculture because Modern ag replaced about 10,000 years or more of sustainable indigenous food systems in North America that were really centered on relationship with the land and community health. 
And we know that our current food system doesn't deliver those same um, benefits. And so we can focus on local as a way to grow capacity for growing, um, processing and distributing food within our communities, um, on building agroecological systems for growing food. Uh, we can respect producers and give them more decision-making power in our food systems and create food systems that really feed all folks and give everyone a voice and representation in their food system. And that's counter to a modern ag system where we know that 98% of farmers are white and they're mostly male. And we have a system that really puts the food dollar in our retailers and our food processors and kind of pits producers and, and consumers against each other in terms of producers needing a fair price and consumers um, needing to be able to afford food. And so we have an extractive food system right now that's kind of born out of these same ideas of, of the myth of Thanksgiving and, and one that claims to say that it feeds the world when in reality, we just, we create a lot of calories for animal feeding operations and for ethanol. And smallholder pe peasants, meanwhile, make 70% of the world's food. So we wanna create local food systems that ask, as much about how healthy the soil is as they do about, does everyone have access to healthy food? Um, are we meeting people exactly where they are, exactly where they access food and making sure that we have systems that um, <laughs> take care of food workers and everyone throughout the food chain. And so that's our opportunity when we think about rebuilding local food systems that are a totally different paradigm than the current system. And so Arrow has a few contributions to that. Um, and, and we invite you to connect to your Montana food. We have a map called the Abundant Montana Map and it's a food systems directory. You can search for farms and ranches. You can search for specific products and you can even search for restaurants, retailers or food pantries that source locally. We also try to make the directory as transparent as possible so that customers can find local food, fair, humane, regenerative, whatever their values are and why, why local matters to you. Um, you can meet yourself, your family and your friends just right where you are. And that's a perfect way to introduce some local food uh, to the Thanksgiving table by connecting with whatever your family's or friend's values are. We also um, are creating a food exchange. So watch out for this. It's a way that individuals or groups can put a need they have or they can offer something. So we've heard a lot throughout COVID that there's this excess of potatoes. I think Shane might know something about this, right? And so with the, with the food exchange, a farmer could go up and put name, contact info, and I have so many pounds of potatoes in the same, and so that's an offer. Whereas um, another group might say, I'm a local food pantry in such and such place, and we're looking um, to stock our freezer with frozen veggies. We have a need for frozen veggies. And so it'll be a real-time exchange, um, definitely live by the end of the year, where folks can go and do this organic sharing, you know, of food that's so natural to, to our producers and, and really celebrates the spirit of Thanksgiving as, as we celebrate it. I also want to welcome you to take a look at the awesome resources that this team has put um, together tonight. And um, Arrow has you know, we really encourage grow your own food, buy some localized food for your Thanksgiving table, whether it's health, economy, environment, whether it's something you hunted, hunted or grew yourself, or you just want to buy something from your neighbor. There are lots of great reasons um, to support local. And we also invite you to support native communities, especially if you're gonna use traditional foods um, on your Thanksgiving table, support folks who, um, are in native communities and and there's a food demo I can't wait to see this this evening try a traditional recipe and learn about its cultural significance and how it brings people together uh, these are ways that we can give thanks we can give back to the land and support our localized food systems and we can share what we have with others which again is is 
the, the good side, the part of the truth that we want to continue about Thanksgiving. So I look forward to the discussion and any of your questions moving forward. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, and we will talk more about that resource document later and how to find it and the kinds of links that are there. Don't want to bore you with that right now, but it will be accessible to everyone. Um, and I just have to give an extra shout out. The Abundant Directory is in the process of being redesigned right now. Super excited to see that when it comes out. Um, Lindsay undersold some of the other work that Arrow has done, Montana Food Economy Initiative. She has a biochar effort that she's supporting. And there's also our own local community carrot effort here in the Valley. Um, I don't know if anyone read that article when it came out in the paper, but there's some really, really interesting things underway. So thank you. Um, I am going to remind everyone that if you want to ask questions, go ahead and type them in the chat now as they occur to you. We have a couple of folks behind the scenes who are curating those, um, but we are going to hold off on all questions until the end of the panel. So next, it is my pleasure to introduce more fully Dr. Shane Doyle. He, um, Shane is an educational and cultural consultant. He hails from Crow Agency, Montana, now based in Bozeman. Dr. Doyle is involved with curriculum design for groups like the National Park Service, Montana OPI, and the National Native American Hall of Fame. He's an environmental advocate who works as a collaborative liaison between groups like the Montana Wilderness Association, the US Forest Service, and the Upsalika Nation. He's also a researcher, co-PI on a NSF funded project that's studying ancient ice patches on the Beartooth Plateau and a partner with the University of Copenhagen where he served as a postdoc from 2014 to 2016. As a singer of Northern Plains music, Shane also serves as assistant director, artistic director and performer for Mountain Time Arts and has co-produced numerous performance art pieces, including this year's The Creek Between Us. So with no further ado, again, Shane, um, my pleasure to introduce you. Oh, thank you so much. Wow, what a great honor to be here this evening. And it's just so good to see everyone out there. Um, and I just, I don't have a whole lot to add. I thought Lindsay did a wonderful job, um, you know, just kind of outlining all of the amazing uh, resources we have here in Montana. and. You know, the spirit of the day, um, you know, just kind of focusing on that Thanksgiving spirit. And, uh, you know, um, I think that's a great message. And, um, you know, uh, also, uh, Kate, your uh, your 10 items that you listed were really, really salient, I thought. And I really appreciated that. So I'm thankful for all the resources here tonight and to be in everyone's company. And so I want to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about my background and what's happening now in Indian country. And uh, it's funny, uh, you know, um, of course, Plains Indians uh, are famous for um, living off of the land uh, in a harsh environment. And, uh, you know, the environment here in Montana, of course, is extreme uh, in the winter and summer. And uh, all those things uh, that they were able to do uh, for the many thousands of years that they lived here sustainably uh, were uh, in a large part due to the climate, um, you know, how everything was uh, dried and stored. And so they very rarely ate fresh foods. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's interesting because uh, my tribe, uh, my nation, the Apsalaga Nation, uh, we come from an agricultural tradition. And so we used to be growing corn, beans, and squash, and all of those other, you know, essential North American plants along the Mississippi River Valley uh, over 500 years ago. And when we migrated here uh, to the Northern Plains, we brought all of those traditions along with us. And we tried to um, plant and we tried to bring agriculture to this region. And there's a lot of uh, many, many, uh, place names and uh, stories and um, people names that are associated with agriculture and how when we came here to Montana, um, we realized, you know, after a short time that um, we were going to have to become full-time hunter-gatherer and traders. And um, 
you know, so we gave up on corn. Uh, I think the last place they tried to plant corn along the Yellowstone River was at Springdale. And, uh, you know, that, that place is called where the corn died. And so uh, they gave up on corn at that point and they went full time hunting, gathering and trading. And, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of times we think of Plains Indians as just simply hunters and gatherers. But uh, we forget that trade was just as important to them as hunting and gathering. Um, in fact, it was even more of a social uh, essential element to their lives was trade. And, um, and that's really what we're talking about today, uh, this evening is, um, you know, how do we hunt and gather and trade in a way that um, brings us closer to one another and that celebrates the landscape and that leaves a very light trace on the land and leaves a very light trace on us. And I feel like, um, you know, the consumer culture that all of us have been immersed in, um, you know, is constantly sending us message to consume, consume, consume. And, you know, the people that lived here for thousands of years, that wasn't their MO. You know, I mean, they didn't have to eat very much. They liked to eat just as much as the next guy, but, you know, food wasn't what they were thinking about and trying to go for all the time. I mean, they had a spiritual life that they lived. They had a creative life and, um, you know, an intellectual uh, life that they, that they gained great fulfillment from. And I think that the idea of constant consumption was not uh, part of their cultural value system. And, and we've, a lot of those things have changed, of course. Um, and I think that, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that, um, you know, Montana was kind of sterilized uh, about 120 years ago from just about every single source of uh, hunting. You know, there were no bison here, there was no deer or elk. And that started a huge, you know, chain of events here um, that are, we're still reverberating to this day. And, uh, you know, the health of native people has never been any, probably any worse today. Um, and I think a lot of that is because of what we're consuming. Um, now today, uh, I wanna fast forward uh, to where we're at. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of disjointed here, um, but, uh, you know, moving forward to today, again, we're still carrying a lot of the, uh, you know, it hasn't been that long ago, you know, just a few generations ago, really three or four generations, um, from the time that we were really hunting, gathering, and trading on the plains. And, um, you know, we live in food deserts now uh, in the reservation communities. And so, and the tribal governments are inundated, especially over the past half year with COVID-19 uh, crisis and uh, all kinds of different issues that float to the top. And so food sovereignty and food security is something that has, you know, Kind of fallen by the wayside in tribal governments. And so Native people themselves have created nonprofits and groups and organizations, like Lindsay had mentioned up at Browning, to make food sovereignty a uh, reality in their communities. So they're kind of foregoing their tribal governments and just doing things on their own. And we look at Crow Agency, you know, there's at least five nonprofits down there, all started and operated uh, by Native people. Um, and they all help to coordinate to bring in food. They're, they're in constant communication with each other and with Hopa Mountain, who, by the way, that's who I'm representing this evening. Uh, I'm a board member on the Hopa Mountain uh, Board of Directors. Uh, and uh, Bonnie Sachitello sawyer of course, is the director. And uh, she is the point person. She is involved with all those meetings and helps to bring food from Bozeman into the reservation communities like Crow Agency. And once the food gets there, you know, uh, getting it to people before it spoils, uh, figuring out how to uh, keep everything safe, not pass COVID-19 to each other. Um, these are all some of the challenges that we've faced this year. But I think the, uh, the upside to all that is that when the COVID-19 crisis subsides, um, you know, we're gonna have more, a better infrastructure in place uh, to see how we can better serve the community and nonprofits. But I don't think that that's going to at all make up for the fact that we need to integrate uh, healthier food systems, um, that we need to, um, you know, look more towards not just bringing food in from different sources around on food trucks or food that got here on a food truck and then came to the reservation, but 
actually doing what the Blackfeet are doing and, you know, trying to harvest their own bison and use all their own landscape uh, to create their own calories. And from that perspective, I have to say that in Indian country, the Blackfeet are the leaders in that. Um, you know, the Salish Kootenai also do a lot of great things. And I, the tr other tribal communities have to really, you know, pay attention to what they're doing and, uh, you know, try and figure out how they can do those same things in their communities, because right now it's not really happening. And so I know I don't want to take up too much time because um, I know Kay Ann has some uh, stuff that she's going to do too. Thank you very much, Shane. Twice in one evening, I appreciate what you are offering to us. Um, <laughs> and now I am, uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Kay Ann, Chef Kay Ann Miller, but she actually is gonna defer speaking in person until our discussion portion of the evening because we have a video that captures a earlier session where we recorded um, her cooking demo, uh, which was done fantastically and we'll talk about that more in the credits and we'll mention that. So Chef Kayan Miller, who serves as executive sous chef for MSU Culinary Services at Montana State University, received her culinary degree from Northwest Culinary Academy of Vancouver in Canada. She is responsible for culinary staff and food production at Miller Dining Commons and helps non-native and native students as well as community members experience pre-contact foods in cooperation with MSU's Department of Native American Studies, Creative Nations, the MSU American Indian Council Powwow, the Museum of the Rockies, and other community outreach programs. Kayan is also the founder of Local Fair Catering, a small business dedicated to using local seasonal ingredients from Big Sky Country. So now, here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kay Ann Miller. I'm an executive sous chef at Montana State University, where I focus on local foods and indigenous foods. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what local might mean in a larger context, and also about how we might eat for conservation. Now we're going to do two dishes today. Uh, one is a native fish keepers lake trout dish and the other is a stuffed squash dish. Uh, we're gonna to start today with the native fish keepers lake trout. These beautiful fillets come to us from uh, Flathead Lake uh, from the Salish and Kootenai Confederated Tribes. And the beautiful thing about this fish is that when we eat it, we help rebuild the natural ecosystem in the Flathead Lake. These fish were introduced in 1905, and they have outcompeted our native bull trout in that lake. And so this uh, corporation was set up to fish out the lake trout and restore the habitat for the native bull trout. The other thing that I really like about this product is that it's 45 minutes from net to completely filleted and frozen, and when you eat it, it is fresh and lovely. The second component of this dish is gonna be a huckleberry sauce. I have some huckleberries here that we foraged in the, again, in the Flathead area. When you are out foraging, there are just so many beautiful things that you can forage for in Montana. Please be sure that you're foraging ethically. Make sure that you have a permit for the land if you need one, uh, and certainly make sure that you have permission. And most importantly, be conservative. These berries support people's lives and livelihood. So be sure that, that you're foraging ethically when you harvest these. This is super simple to make. We're just gonna put it in the pan, uh, add some salt to the pan and a little sugar, boil that off. And then we're going to take it to the thickness that you would like it for your dish with a cornstarch slurry. And it's gonna take a little bit of cornstarch, mix it with some water, mix it up and add it to the, the boiling huckleberries. And again, just take that to the thickness you want. I went very thick with mine. 
because I want to draw a design on my plate when we're finished. Uh, the other component of this dish is going to be wild rice. We're also going to use the wild rice in our squash dish. This wild rice uh, comes to us courtesy of the Red Lake Nation in Minnesota. The proceeds from the rice help uh, conserve waterways and restore waterways uh, in tribal habitat there in Minnesota. So the secret of wild rice is that whatever you're measuring with, you want three of those full of water and one of them full of wild rice. So we're just going to put this in our pan. We do not have to have the water boiling ahead of time. I'm going to bring it to a boil, uh, salt it to the degree, degree that you think is lovely. And unlike other rices, this is not going to be done in 20 minutes. You need to allow yourself about an hour to cook your wild rice. When I'm cooking wild rice, I like to cook mine till it's bloomed, which means that the kernels have popped open and we can see the insides, this, this lighter material here. That way you're still going to have a little texture, but they are not going to be hard at all. So our wild rice is going to be for our trout dish, it's going to be for our squash dish. So on top of our trout, we've just simply sprinkled a mixture of ground juniper seeds. And I got these from Fisher Spice here in town, available at Town & Country. And I've mixed pretty much equal parts of salt and ground juniper with a little bit of, of ground pepper from the pepper grinder. Uh, my grandmother used to do this with a mortar and pestle. I say, hey, let's use a spice grinder. They're just going straight into the grinder. And some of them are going other places. We're just going to grind these up until they are basically the texture of cracked pepper that you would get out of a pepper grinder. And they are going in our pan here. Going to add some very coarse ground salt here. I want to mix this up until it looks like it's about 50% juniper berry and 50% salt. And we're just going to sprinkle that right over the top of our fish. And our fish is going to go in the oven. Our second dish is going to use this beautiful squash. Uh, I got this from Western Growers Co-op uh, simply because I thought they were beautiful and lovely. You can also get awesome local squash here in town at the farmer's markets uh, or from local producers that you might know. To do this dish, uh, you can also do it with pumpkin. It's a Hidatsa style dish that we're doing. I've just cut the top off, cleaned out the inside so that it's smooth. I did save the seeds so that I could bake those off for something else. And we are going to take our finished wild rice and I'm going to show you two different squash today. This one that I'm putting together is a sweeter squash and it contains um, flathead uh, cherries. These happen to be from Fat Robin contains uh, raw pumpkin seeds. Here we've got the wild rice in its uh, original format. If you wanted to, you could dice up this lovely creature right here, which is a jicama, uh, indigenous to the Americas. And when we think local and when we think indigenous, I encourage us to think Montana, but also to think beyond so when we are doing indigenous foods at the university, for example, we only do foods that were here prior to 1492. We really want to look at the decolonialized uh, food system and look at the beautiful and sophisticated products that people had to work with uh, before contact. 
So this jicama is a nice sweet crunch to throw in your dish if you care to. What I've done is I've just mixed up some of our wild rice. Uh, I've thrown in some flathead cherries here, thrown in my pumpkin seeds, stirred that up till it's just all mixed in. And then all we're going to do is put it in our squash. Not very neatly, but put it in our squash. Clean up the edges. Stick our natural cap on. And this is going to go in the oven. How long it cooks takes to cook depends on your squash, how thick the walls are, how big the squash or the pumpkin is. Uh, so what I usually do is I put it in a 350 oven for 20 minutes. And then after that, every once in a while, I'll just give it a little poke to see if it's gotten soft and easy to eat. So that's all there is for our squash dish. Our trout has been in the oven just a short time. I've gone ahead and plated that. You want to cook your trout to 135 to be safe, but some of us like it more rare. Um, and so here we have our finished dish. I've taken the huckleberry sauce, just put a blob of it on the plate. I have a lovely plating tool that you can get here at Bridger Kitchens. I just drew a nice design with it. Uh, I put some of our plain wild rice on the side, and we have local greens, again, from Livingston from Montana Roots. The squash that I cooked off for you today is a more savory one than we put together just a little bit earlier. We've got the wild rice, we've got pinion nuts, which are also indigenous to the Americas, and we've got red peppers, all peppers are originally American peppers and indigenous to this area. And there's also a wild onion on the top of this as well. And I just want to thank Wanda Kemper at Bridger Kitchens for making this beautiful space available to us. And I really want to encourage you to think about how what you can eat can assist with conservation and can assist with uh, helping support local infrastructure food sustainability, and local food systems. And I look forward to visiting with you on the live portion of the program. Thank you so much for your time today. All right, I'm hungry. <laughs> that was fabulous, Kay Ann. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I have awesome. to mention that although Kay Ann Miller is an experienced chef who has taught many classes, and although Jason of Devolution Films and of the Bozeman Doc series is an experienced filmmaker with many credits um, as a cinematographer, this is the first cooking demo that either of them has ever made. So kudos to the, the two of you for pulling this off. Um, so welcome everyone to the discussion portion of our event. Um, First, just to explain how this will work, I wanna give our panelists a chance to ask each other questions. And then um, Kareen Irby, who is also on the call is helping us. She's monitoring the chat. And so as your questions come in, she'll be curating those and sharing those with the panelists. Um, if you want to ask your question out loud rather than typing it, you can type that in the chat as well and we have the power to unmute you. You just can't unmute yourself. Um, and last but not least, for those of you who are joining us by phone, I'm sorry, we really don't have a way for you to ask questions, so I apologize. Um, so Kay Ann, Shane, Lindsay, do any of the, the three of you have a question for each other or something you wanna add at this point? Maybe we should start with Kay Ann since you just finished your beautiful video. Can you unmute yourself or do you need Rick's help? I got it. Great. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for the kind comments in the chat and thanks Jason and uh, Kareem for making uh, that video for us. I really appreciate that. And um, 
I really wanted to ask uh, Lindsay uh, if she could um, talk a little bit more, since she's a re registered dietitian, um, if she would share a little bit about the impact on our own health uh, that comes from eating locally. Great, yeah, thanks for that question, Kayan. Um, let's see, so I became interested in local food systems because I had worked at the community supported agriculture on my college campus and really saw that folks who were connecting with their food in that way had a lot more variety in their diet. And so there are some like steadfast principles in nutrition, which are variety, moderation, um, and balance, right? So we, we, we want to have make sure that we have a lot of variety and we know that if we're eating folks that are folks, <laughs> food that comes from the earth, uh, we have different things. Um, first in the spring, we have um, the shoots that come up, then the leaves, then the fruit. And then later on, if the roots have nutrition in them um, and our foods, we have those. So we can kind of follow the life of a plant and get a lot of diverse nutrition. And maybe you measure that diversity and that variety uh, throughout a week. Maybe you measure it in a month, maybe throughout the year, right? Um, and those are all different ways that we can look at, um, you know, getting the nourishment um, we need. And I also think, you know, it's just really important to uh, help folks um, and encourage them to their intuitive sense of eating when they're hungry and stopping when they're full and, and knowing that um, all foods can fit in a healthy diet. And um, we can also take, take note of how we feel in our bodies when we eat different kinds of foods. So maybe um, if I eat a lot of sugar at a given sitting, I might feel like lethargic after that. And I'm using my own body's feedback to kind of understand how those foods affect me. And if I um, happen to be on the road and I eat gas station food for two meals and I get home after a six hour drive, maybe I'm like really craving a salad. And I think we like very, if we have variety in our diet and we're taking cues from all the different kinds of foods that nature offers, I think we can be really good at tuning into ourselves and eating intuitively based on how we feel with certain foods in our diet. And there's really no right way or wrong way to eat, um, but, but we can certainly learn a lot from looking at what's available around us. Thanks for that question, Kayan. Shane or Lindsay, do you have uh, any questions that you wanna ask before we see if anything's come in? I'm happy to move towards audience questions. Excellent. Kareen, do we have many coming in? Um, it doesn't seem like it. I just wanted to point out for those of you who haven't seen the chat, there's a few different um, resources that other people have shared. So thanks for doing that. Alice, um, hi Alice, um, has a link to the myth of Thanksgiving, um, a link there that, that would be really interesting for people to ch check out. In addition to that, um, Kayan did put a link to native producers uh, and where you can find them. So check that out as well. It looks like Julie got her, her question answered about food banks. Uh, seems like Hopa Mountain, thank you, Bonnie, for responding to that. Hopa Mountain uh, could use some volunteer help uh, next week and beyond. Um, and they are limiting their numbers in the office due to COVID, um, but they are still needing help. So um, their contact information is there too. Uh, Katie got her question answered about the spice grinder. Uh, so thanks for, for helping out everyone about that. Um, also, Minna did post our resource. So Minna Choi um, in the chat did post our resource list um, of everything that, um, that includes the recipes that Kayan um, shared in the cooking demo. So check that out. And then we do have some new messages here. So let's see. Uh, Yes, to Kayan, Julie asks, I love that you mentioned that pinion nuts are native to the Americas, but most that you can buy in stars are from China or Russia. 
and are not harvested sustainably? Any thoughts on careful sourcing? That's a really great question. So um, there's lots of indigenous um, foods available, especially when we really get to exploring what foods originated in the Americas. Um, but uh, pinion, are particularly troubling because they're mass harvested now in other countries. Um, they are processed and sent to us. And so the carbon footprint on those is huge. Um, and I am drawing a total blank, but um, I source mine out of uh, New Mexico, out of um, a um, Pueblo that I cannot think of the name of. Um, is there a way that I can share that later, like Kate? Yeah, we can definitely add that to the resource list or just... Um... Yeah, that'd be great because I'm just trying to blank on their name, but you can get mesquite from them as well. And that is community harvested. They're, re they're really expensive. Uh, and the reason for that is because the, it's a lot of work. They're hard to harvest. They're hard to uh, process without cracking, get the shells off without cracking the nuts. Um, but at least that way, you know that you didn't get them from China. And actually, I'll, I'll change that. I think the resource document is pretty much set but, and gorgeous. It'll be tough to add it in there, but um, we can put it out on our Facebook page and anybody who wants that information can email openlocalmt at gmail.com and I can send that resource to you once I get it from Kayan. So Elizabeth uh, mentioned a native seed source out of Tucson. That's a great, I think that's a great source. Great. So, um, Kate, so, I, I came up with a question if it's all right for other panelists. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, so as a dietitian, I just have like a rule, like I never talk about food with my family unless I'm asked a really specific question. <laughs> and so I have tried and failed to introduce new foods at our Thanksgiving table um, and other family meals. And I'm curious from the other panelists, um, if you have any tips, tricks, um, just like rockstar recipes um, that you use when you're introducing new foods that folks may be less familiar with um, to your tables. I'll start with that. So um, the my go-to is I'm gonna make a flathead cherry sauce on elk or maybe bison, depending on what I have because it's red meat, it's approachable. A lot of people around here have had um, flathead cherries. And so, and it's a ridiculously good combination mm -hmm. and most people will eat that. Um, for my own family, the way I solve the problem is I just stop putting non-native food on the table. And if they wanted to eat, they ate what I put out. Yeah, they, they were quite, they were not highly amused right at the beginning, but they got over that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's great. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that um, you're uh, really integrating these native foods and, um, you know, I should do my part. I should do a lot better. Um, you know, I tried and uh, uh, Ken, you might remember, I kind of had a, a, a small catering business I started mm -hmm. a few, several years ago. Um, and was catering indigenous meals for a while. Um, but once uh, I got over 50 people, the quality started to diminish considerably. So I decided I better stick to the research agenda. Um, but I, that particular meal that I made was pretty good. I, I thought it was a quinoa recipe that I came up with. I, uh, you know, I got the quinoa, of course, which is an ancient American food. And um, it was a pretty popular recipe. I kind of... Uh, uh, fried it first and with some tomatoes um, mm -hmm. and uh, put in a little hot sauce and then I put in the, um, the chicken stock and uh, cooked it up and so it kind of had a little spicy kick to it and um, so I paired that with a bison meatloaf and um, in the bison meatloaf was a great uh, recipe for a large group because it stays moist you know you don't have to worry about it drying out and you can keep it warm for a long time. Um, and then I just kind of stuck with um, 
a real nice light um, dessert, which, you know, typically just some fruit, an orange or apple, um, something along those lines. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I should have included, or I wish I would have included that on part of my recipes was that rice, that wild rice recipe that you just showed there. I mean, that is just out of this world, but I think the quinoa, you know, um, it's, if you cook it right and you put the right spices in there, it makes it much more appealing. And, um, and I think it's really healthy. You know, it's got all of the amino acids. Um, and I don't think it's too expensive. I mean, it's not as cheap as rice, but it's definitely healthier. So that, that's a few things. And, and I'm not officially a panelist, but I'll offer something as well. <laughs> Um, uh, less recipe specific, but I have been to Thanksgivings that it was less about trying to be healthy or trying to be anything specific. It was just wrapped in fun. So I went to one Thanksgiving mm. where it was like all curried. It was actually one of the most mm. delicious Thanksgivings I've ever wow. been to. Um, and, and just having fun with a meal and you have an extra strike against you because your family knows you're a dietitian. So you're sort of screwed. Um, right. But if you just present <laughs> something as fun recipe you heard from someone rather than a healthy, yummy, good local thing, like then you can tell them after the fact, kind of like the time I made ice cream that had yogurt in it. Mm. My dad mm. loved it until he found out it had yogurt in it. And then he wasn't so sure he liked it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Anyway. Well, um, if I could just follow up, you know, by saying that, you know, all of the, the most of the foods that we eat today, ag agriculturally speaking, come from America. Um, and even the most basic products that we couldn't conceive our lives without, like chocolate and vanilla, you know, those are both from America. Um, and so I think, you know, when we look historically on what America has given the world, you know, probably a lot more than it's received. But part of the reason why you didn't see the same type of um, societies here is because they didn't have the domesticated animals. Um, but we you know we did have turkeys. And so uh, anyone who's enjoying turkey out there for Thanksgiving, remember that is really an American food. And it probably should have been our national bird had it been up to Ben Franklin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was really struck by um, something that's happened to me over the last couple of weeks. I'm participating in an international indigenous food conference online. And last week there was a speaker from Turkey and she was talking about foods that were indigenous to Turkey, but all her photos were um, potatoes, corn, tomatoes, peppers. And I thought what a shame that is because those are all foods from the Americas that, you know, when they hit Europe really changed the culinary world of that time. And um, so I really encourage you, like if you're exploring your own family background, to really dig deep and say, mm -hmm. what did we eat in Turkey or wherever prior to 1492? Because the world's entire diet changed after 1492. Yep. Thank you. So there we are also started smoking after our meals. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a few other questions here from uh, the audience. Uh, Donnie asks, I would be thankful to see a resource list for indigenous seed providers if you all have one. Um, Native Seed Search was mentioned, um, which uh, has a lot of good things. I'm not sure if any, anyone else on the panel has any other ideas. Um, let me come back to the panel. I am going to post a couple links. I'll just post those in chat. Great, great. Thanks, Can. And then we have a question for Shane. Uh, you mentioned that preserved food was more common than fresh food in pre-contact diets. What kind of foods were preserved versus what foods were eaten fresh? Yeah, it's a great point. You know, uh, there was really hardly ever anything eaten fresh. Um, because then uh, if you think about the winter time, um, you know, when the animals around here, the, the, the migratory animals like bison, elk and deer would become much harder to hunt. And so you had to be prepared. Um, I'll give you one anecdote. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, but um, there was a Cheyenne village 
uh, that was a, uh, was during the Plains Indian Wars back in 1877. Um, and they, uh, they attacked the village and they did an inventory on all of the meat that was there. And there was 2000 pounds of dried bison meat uh, and that, that village, that incident occurred in March of 1877. They're talking about, you know, which basically the springtime of the year, they still had 2,000 pounds of dried meat. You know, if you, I wonder how many pounds they had back in January, you know, and how much they went through. I mean, they were really prepared. They knew how to um, process their resources. They knew how to store them. Um, they knew how to keep them, again, from spoiling or being, um, you know, going to waste, everything was used. Um, the few times that they did have fresh food and meat was if there was a, a kill, you know, um, you know, they would probably have a big barbecue and cook up the, cook up the bones and all of that um, for the marrow and, uh, you know, roasts and whatnot. Um, and then of course, when they harvested uh, choke cherries and um, other berries at, to begin with, but uh, again, those were also dried, dried in the sun, um, basically kind of slow cooked in the sun, really. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully, the climate allowed that. Uh, otherwise, they would have they wouldn't have been able to uh, preserve their foods in the same way. So, yeah, they and then, you know, you hear about people talking or I've heard people ask questions are common about native people cooking in their teepees. And I just don't think that they ever did. I mean, um, all their food was already dried like dried and ready. And when they did cook, I think they probably cooked outside on a fire if they were going to have a barbecue. Um, Corrine, I was going to take a question from the chat from Cindy, speaking of fresh turkeys, suggestions on where to purchase a local fresh turkey. And I was typing away and then I just realized it would be easier to speak. <laughs> Um, so I, that's a tough one. I know that we have local chicken that Black Dog Farm raises. I know that the Community Food, food Co-op carries a couple different types of turkey raised different ways. Um, and the thing that this brings to mind for me, while I don't have a direct answer for how to find a local turkey, is the issue of meat processing in the state of Montana. And that yeah. there's a really strong effort right now to bring back what is called ag in the middle and to enhance the ability to process meats for sale. Um, poultry is a whole nother bowl of wax in terms of uh, the food safety rules around it. Um, so I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer for you, but you kind of nailed one of the main issues with rebuilding our local food systems so that we can have fresh local when it makes sense. So you can get um, turkeys from the, the Springdale Hutterite colony. Yep. And um, if you don't know somebody that, that hunts them, they're kind of a lot of work to pluck and everything, but um, Hutterites is, are the biggest source that I know. I know that Black Dog does some turkeys too and they oh. process them on farm. Um, okay. as well. I don't know if they're already spoken for, but I think processing is not only a question to meat processing of like our food security and our, our ability to make all these meat animals we raise in the state available to us here without shipping them out, but it, um, the availability of processing also really impacts the cost of food um, at the end of the day too. So uh, thanks Thank Kate for bringing up this discussion. Though. Uh, Somebody asked a question about the TNC turkeys. Uh, they do have Hutterite turkeys. Uh, they're Hutterite, they're not all Hutterite, but they do have Hutterite as well as others. Uh, they're Hutterite turkeys, or at least there were at Rose Hours. Uh, Daniel's Gourmet Meats and Sausages uh, has Hutterite turkeys as well. We're getting near the end. Karine, are there a lot more questions coming in? Uh, we have one from Keeley. Just anyone have an answer as to why people may react so strongly against yogurt ice cream or some sort of healthy alternative to a norm? I could take a crack at that, but it's not a, I'm not a psychologist, but I do think that people get very stuck in their ways and certain things become very symbolic to them. 
Yeah. And when you're mucking with something, there are a number of gut reactions in the people I know that lead them to be less inclined to accept it as an adventure and with curiosity and more inclined to see you as trying to push something on them. So it's really a matter of knowing the person you're working with. Um, but I think there's a number of factors there. There's but also a lot of um, recent uh, work in terms of uh, looking at your taste buds and the wiring into your brain now that we can see what's going on in your brain when you're doing things. And um, there's quite a bit of evidence that what you eat in childhood really impacts the wiring in your brain and what your body thinks it should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even in vitro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and there's more evidence of that um, in terms of like um, sugar alcohols, the sweetness, um, that we have on, that we experience on our tongue can make, um, the same metabolic reaction to normal sugar because of the sweet taste. Um, so there, there are a lot, there's a lot of new research about, um, taste and how that influences our brain. Um, I also think, you know, I, I had worked in school districts and we, Children sometimes need to try something like 11, 18, over 20 times just to increase their familiarity. And so decreasing the stakes and just um, not making a food a good or bad food, not making um, a reward system around food is also kind of foundational to raising um, intuitive eaters or eaters that are adventurous um, and willing to try something when there's not a lot of emotional attachment um, to introducing new food. So just neutrally putting it out there, letting any reaction be okay, um, and asking a lot of questions about how does this smell? How does this feel in your mouth? What does it look like? But really not having any kind of strong reaction to like, um, I mean, it's polite to teach manners and say, please don't yuck my yum, but letting um, someone have their own taste preferences um, and no matter what those might be. So that's some of the, the research behind um, introducing new foods. When uh, I was up at the Culinary Academy in Vancouver, Canada, um, mm. There's an organization up there that teaches uh, cooking skills to little tiny people like preschool, five, six, seven. Um, and it's in all the, Van the Vancouver uh, schools now, um, but it started out in just one in a lower income school. But what they found out is that people are much more willing to try things if they don't have a family member present who's judging. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, you'll hear it a lot of times, like like when we have folks over to dinner and I'll say, how about peas? And mom says, oh, Joey doesn't like peas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, what, why don't we let Joey decide whether Joey mm -hmm. likes peas? And the, the people are much more willing to try things when there's no family member present. Mm -hmm. Or if you hit them right when they're stubborn adolescents, they won't let their parent answer for them and they might just say I do too mom and then go. have to eat whatever it is that's been put on their plate so sometimes <laughs> that works. if you have a really stubborn person and I wouldn't know anything about this right uh, right me neither <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, we really probably should get to our wrap up and our final comments um is there any final Thoughts from our panelists or any final question, Corrine? There are a couple final questions. Just Mel and Kim say, is stevia safe and okay because it's from a plant um, in relation to um, talking about sugar? Um, and then there is a question for Shane. What did they use to flavor their food pre-contact? Were there any commonly used herbs or something similar? Great question. You know, their, their favorite uh, all-time food that was pretty common through all the tribes was pemmican and that's just a mixture of uh, choke cherries and meat and a little bit of fat and so that is a, kind of a power bar type of uh, protein mix you know you have a lot of fiber in there you have the sweetness from the berries 
Uh, you have, of course, high protein and you have a little fat that sticks to your ribs and a very healthy uh, food that they came up with and uh, could be preserved because of the, uh, of the acidic mixture of the berries and, uh, and how it was dried. Um, you know, it could last for a really long time and, and it's still eaten today. And so I think um, outside of that, you know, um, they didn't really have a lot of different flavorings that they used, I think, um, that I know of. Um, you know, I think uh, in the summer, of course, when there was fresh uh, plants available, uh, I'm sure they probably use a lot of different uh, types of uh, herbs and forbs to, uh, you know, help spice up their meals. Um, and of course, they love to trade for, for uh, you know peppers and stuff too. Yep. So the, you know, Shane mentioned the trade earlier also. And one of the things that I think is really sad is that, you know, we look to Europe and the East and the Middle East, and we think about the Silk Road and all the spices that were traded on that. And we think of that as being very sophisticated and, you know, all these luxury items. We had that in the Americas we just don't talk about it. We were trading chocolate and peppers and vanilla and um, nuts that were used for flavoring and ground and all different kinds of things. Um, the, I don't know. Seashells. Some, yeah, anything. I mean, decorative artistic uh, creations, um, you name it, um, quill work. Um, you know, I mean, there was a constant steady stream of trade and, uh, and it, it was very much part of the uh, culture for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And bringing it back to spices, I don't know if anybody wants to mention a book. That I feel like there have been a couple that have been written about mm -hmm. some of the earlier spices. I don't know if there's a thorough piece on that. If yeah. Yeah. Um, I have lost you here. Uh -oh. Let me try to see if I can get back in. We can hear you. We can hear you and see you. Can you see me? Excellent. I'm going to yeah. show you my books. I can't see you at all. Um, You're flying blind. Yeah, I am. So this is uh, Foods of the uh, Southwest Indian Nations. Uh, Lois Ellen Frank wrote it. It's awesome. It's one of my favorites. Uh, along with Spirit of the Harvest, which is uh, Spirit of the Harvest, North American Indian cooking. The thing I like about this is that it, it represents styles from all over North America. And if you want to do something fun and modern, the Mitzitam cookbook, which is uh, Mitzitam is the restaurant in the um, Museum of the American Indian in the Smithsonian. Uh, yep. This is a great cookbook for bringing uh, traditional foods into a modern context. And so is the sous chef's cookbook, but I have loaned that out to someone. So <laughs> there's, there's lots, it, it's, a, it's a growing field and there's lots of books if you just Google indigenous cookbooks. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, I'm going to have to cut us off. So the stevia question, I, I, I'm going to put that one on hold unless you have like a, a 15 second answer, Lindsay. No, um, it is a very important question and a good question a lot of people have had. So I'm sorry to cut us off. Um, Moving into the, the closing piece here, it's uh, pretty clear that local regional community food systems, they have a lot of moving parts. There's like what makes up the food system, you grow it, you process it, you store it, you transport it, you buy it, you eat it. Um, but there's also the policy and the culture around the food, deciding and helping you think about and helping our uh, communities create the systems that allow us to access local foods. So as our speakers tonight have illustrated, um, it's worth considering more deeply where our food comes from and finding ways to shift our habits. So our day-to-day -day choices support a food system that is moving towards nurturing a triple bottom line, the health of the land and the people, as well as the economy. Um, 
as I run through the rest of this, if there's anything else you desperately want to learn more about or you think a future webinar next November might cover, let us know. Um, I'd be curious about that. But before I go, one thing I really want to stress is that we do have this fantastic resource document for you. And I know the link has gone out in the chat. Thanks to Minna Choi for pulling that together and sharing it with you. It's also gonna go out in an email after this event and it will be posted to the Gallatin Valley Earth Day website. Um, we did wanna leave you with uh, an invitation, a three-part invitation before you take off. Um, number one, eat with intention. The recipes in the resource document, the links that can help you find local food, online markets um, that our farmers have set up. Um, I will also note that there are three winter farmers markets left this year and a special Thanksgiving market planned out at Rocky Creek Farm. And then I wanna give a shout out for those of you who get tired of cooking occasionally and maybe you don't feel comfortable going to a restaurant but you can still do takeout. Our farm to table restaurants like all restaurants right now in this time of COVID are really feeling the strain of the lack of tourists and the lack of interest in going out. Um, and I have to say, if businesses are gonna go under, I would love to have our farm to table restaurants, the ones who are really trying to walk the walk, be the ones who are there on the other end of this. So please remember to support those. Um, there's a, I don't know if we have, we have a list of some of them on the resource document, just to, if you're not familiar. Our, the second part, of my three part, our three part invitation is just to go a little bit deeper. There's a slew of links in this document. Um, one of them from Allison Harmon up at MSU. Um, and she walks through what it's like to live off $3 a day for five days and an experiment that she does with her students. I could really name, we have some articles that have been written by our speakers um, and other resources. It's, it's a pretty broad list. So we invite you to go there. And then the third part of the invitation is really just to engage. Um, engage more with our local food system in whatever ways you can. And we have two ideas on that resource sheet, but I'm only gonna talk about one of them right now, which is highlighting the fact that Bozeman is about to adopt a climate action plan. Um, we're on the cusp and it includes as one of the 16 solutions, cultivating a robust local food system which is brilliant because most people, when they think about addressing climate change, think about energy, but people are starting to understand mm -hmm. that food is part of the picture. Yep. Um, their next work session that the city commission is gonna be having is a week from tonight on the 17th. So if anybody wants to tune in or send in comments before that. And then on the 9th of December, there is a hearing and they're scheduled to have a resolution to adopt. So you can put that on your calendars. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Anne to conclude our evening. But first, just thank you all so much um, for joining us. And may you have a nutritious, local, inclusive, and happy giving of thanks celebration this, this November. Thank you, Kate. And I just wanted to second that. And um, we look forward to having you join us in January for our next Gallatin Valley 2040 event. So you can just visit um, www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org for more information about that. Um, thanks. I just want to say Thanksgiving is a time for gratitude. And I am so grateful for everyone who helped make tonight a success. Uh, this evening would not have happened without an event platform and someone to run it. So we're deeply appreciative of Rick Taylor, who um, his expertise helped make this evening run smoothly. And we're also very grateful to Bozeman Citizens Climate Lobby and Education for offering use of their Zoom platform for this event. Um, if you'd like more information about this nonpartisan group that's working to make a brighter 2040, please visit them at citizensclimatelobby.org slash chapters slash MT underscore Bozeman um, to find out more about them. And then um, additional thanks, of course, has to go out to our, we had some tech support. If anyone had problems getting in at the beginning, I want to thank Jory Reddy and Kristen Walzer for helping people get into the event. 
Um, I wanted to thank our chat monitors, Kareen Irby of Broken Ground and Minna Cho Choi from the MR NRDC. And Minna also um, created that excellent resource um, list that you'll be getting in an email from us. And thanks so much, Kate, for being a great moderator for tonight's event. Um, you did a fantastic job. And of course, I'm really so grateful to our wonderful panelists, um, Lindsay Ganong from Aero and Dr. Shane Doyle for joining us representing Hopa Mountain. And of course, executive sous chef Kayan Miller from Montana State and founder of Local Fair Catering. Um, we, I think we all agree, we really enjoyed the cooking demo. And, um, and that only could have happened with the generosity from Bridger Kitchens for providing the facility so we could film it there. And a uh, special shout out to the special talents of Jason Burlage of Devil of uh, Devolution Films and Bozeman Doc series. I mean, he went far and above the call of duty to create this very professional video. We're very appreciative of, of it. It really turned out well. And last but not least, I wanted to shout out to the Bozeman Daily Chronicle for helping us with advertising and Gallatin Valley United Way, who is um, our fiscal sponsor. So in closing, I think just as um, Kate said, from all of us who worked hard on this. We really wanna thank you for joining us and we wish you a very happy day of thanks or Thanksgiving, however you wanna look at it. So thank you for coming. Thank you for everyone participating. Thank you for your comments in the chat and uh, we'll see you in January. Thank you. Good night. Good night guys, thank you. Good night, thank good night. you. If you wanna unmute, I'd love to have you say good night. <laughs> Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Be safe.